Good day, everyone. This is Dr. Dennis Buckley of the Health Advantage, Pasadena, California. This is a presentation to the San Gabriel Valley Junior Athletic, Junior All-America in Football and Cheer on Concussion 2013. This is being presented to educate you, to make you aware of the uh, responsibilities and how to recognize uh, concussion and what should be done so you may follow uh, protocols that are accepted to protect the player, yourself, and the association. 300,000 sports-related concussions occur yearly. Uh, brain injury causes more death than any other injury in sport. 90% of boxers have head injuries. 50% of soccer players sustain head injuries. Uh, and the number one cause for soccer is heading the ball is risky activity. Coach Vince Lombardi many years ago said football is not a contact sport. It is a collision sport. Dancing is a contact sport. So what happens is, is because of the amount of collisions that take place, either a singular event or an accumulation, uh, the incidence of concussion in football accounts for more concussions than any other sport in North America. Uh, the frequency is controversial uh, and reports so the incidence for a single football player is anywhere between 3.6% of the people to 47% of the people have concussion or concussion-like symptoms. It involves over 250,000 injuries per year. 10% uh, of college and 20% of high school athletes have concussions. And football players with brain injuries are six times more likely to sustain another injury. And this is very important later on. So, first of all, let's define concussion. Concussion may be caused by either a direct blow or to the head, face, neck, or somewhere else in the body with an impulsive force that ends up being transmitted to the head. It usually results in the rapid onset of a short-lived impairment of function that resolves spontaneously, so most of the concussions are very quick and short-lived. They may result in pathological, neuropathological changes, meaning in the nervous system, uh, such as brain function, body function, but the acute clinical symptoms largely reflect a functional disturbance rather than a structural injury, meaning nothing's broken, nothing's torn, nothing's damaged, but it does affect the disturbance of function uh, without any damage to the organs. Concussion results in a graded set of clinical symptoms that may or may not involve loss of consciousness. This is an important point. You may have a concussion without losing consciousness. Uh, resolution of the clinical and cognitive symptoms typically follows a sequential source course, meaning it follows a prescribed path that you can identify. However, it is important to note that in a small percent of cases, post-concussion symptoms may be prolonged, meaning that many times people appear to be normal, but actually there is a concussion or symptoms brewing that may show up later. Um, usually what happens is there's no abnormality on standard structural neural imaging studies in seeing a concussion. This means is on a CT scan or an x-ray, everything looks normal. So the definition of concussion is in transition. It changes and it's changed quite a bit. But usually it's an immediate and transient loss of neuronal function secondary trauma, meaning things change in a person. They're not functioning or acting normally as they were before the trauma. And this includes loss of consciousness. You'll see this a lot, LOC, which is loss of consciousness, loss of memory or inability to form new memories, and impairment of motor skills, meaning difficulty walking, dizzy, using their hands, uh, touching their nose, uh, things like this. So regarding the best practices management of concussion, remember the concussion may be caused by a direct blow to the head or elsewhere in the body. Loss of consciousness is a key but not a required factor. Like I said, an individual may be have a concussion without a loss of consciousness, and they may present a wide range of signs and symptoms, such as physical signs of neurological impairment, meaning they're unable to remember things, they don't know where they're at, they can't communicate, or symptoms of impaired brain function, which may include normal behavior, over-emotional, um, very, very uh, out of it, um, behavior that's not normal with the individual. An athlete suspected of a concussion must be removed to play and immediately assessed. So, if you see someone who's really taking a hard hit, it would be probably a good idea, even if they get up right away, to kind of check on them to make sure they're okay. 
The concussed individual must not be allowed to return to play the same day they were concussed if it's been defined that they have a concussion or you suspect a concussion. So keep them out of the game. Any individual with signs of symptoms of a concussion at risk or with discussion should not be allowed to participate in sports until the signs and symptoms have resolved. Now this is important for later on because one of the things we'll be talking about is that to return to play they must have a signed release from a doctor. However, with a signed release and they come back to practice and they start exhibiting signs and symptoms of concussion, they must be removed and sent back to the doctor for further evaluation. So that goes down to a consultation with a qualified health care provider. This include a medical doctor, a chiropractor, or osteopath is essential after a concussion. Individuals with concussion should be directly observed, receive serial examinations, not be left alone after the injury until their constellation of symptoms are static. Meaning that if someone is considered to be concussed and has been having an injury, they should not be left alone. They need to be checked on a regular basis because what will typically happen is they may be a little out of it. They snap out of it. Like I said, it's a transient or a short-lived uh, episode, and then they're fine after that. Well, one thing that you might need to know is that the, that that may be temp that may be temporary, true, but all of a sudden there may be something else brewing in there that could cause some problems. So anytime there's an increase of symptoms, especially a headache, they must get a evaluation urgently. It means emergency room transportation. Um, by an ambulance. A uh, graded return to play protocol must be followed prior to resumption of full sporting activity and we'll talk about that later about what that means. So what this is saying is that you know if a kid, somebody suspected of being having a concussion they must be um, evaluated and they must be watched and see how they progress either for the better or for the worse. If they start having an increase in symptoms they got to be seen immediately at the ER. Like I said, clearance by a qualified health has professional must be sought prior to the athlete return to play. So basically, they need to show up with a signed note that says they're free to play. And the athlete must be symptom-free at rest and with exercise prior to return to play. So if they come back and say, I'm fine, but they go out there and they start practicing, and all of a sudden they start getting dizzy or have a headache, basically they need to be reevaluated. So... Well, mostly in your realm, you'll be dealing with concussions in adolescence. Younger athletes have shown to exhibit longer recovery times compared to adults. They seem to have more symptoms and last longer in females. So this might be true for not so much for uh, football because there's rarely very little free of girls playing football, but more if your daughter was playing in um, soccer or a cheerleader that has an accident where they hit their head and they have a problem. The key impact, the key uh, information here is the thing called the second impact syndrome. A person under age 21 whose initial concussion symptoms are unresolved may suffer sudden death that there is a second concussion within two weeks of the first concussion. So it is clear that adolescents must be protected from this potential catastrophic event. So if a person has a concussion and then they have another trauma to their head, to their body, causing another concussion, it could be fatal. Also, it's been studied that a gene may exist that causes some individuals to be more susceptible to concussion. Many concussed individuals may be unable to concentrate, focus. They may not be able to read or absorb material and may develop an increased headache while doing so. And this can take place in school or in studying. When this occurs, they may be able to participate in an activity for only a few minutes before the symptoms increase. This person is still recovering from the concussion and must not participate in sports. They must be able to make get their um, endurance back up in normal activities like studying, reading, or just doing normal activities of daily living. So as a s individual uh, has longer and longer times of being symptom free, they can get back to their normal activities uh, as much as possible, which includes exercising and returning to play. Some individuals may not be able to attend school, or they may not they may be able to attend school, but they may also have some problems at school with headaches. If this is happening where they're having trouble at school concentrating headaches, they are not allowed to play they, until they get a release from the doctor and they exhibit behavior and being able to do activities such as like go to school, exercise, participate without having symptoms. So 
one of the things that is very important, and this should probably be done before the season starts, is to know which of your um, athletes have had previous diagnosed concussions. But more important is, have you ever had concussion-like symptoms before? Why? Because the brain heals slowly, especially in adolescence. It's uh, still growing, still developing, and it seems to last longer. Uh, before it's completely healed, it's susceptible to a second injury. The second impact syndrome can be developed. And if you do have a concussion, their odds are two to six times more greater for another one. So, so basically, if you have to be very, very impact, important about the second impact syndrome because of death could be one of the consequences or permanent impairment, uh, what happens is an athlete with a seemingly mild concussion may, however, develop within seconds a second impact syndrome and symptoms go up dramatically. Basically, second impact syndrome has a mortality rate up to 50%. So it's very important. It must be prevented whenever possible and recognized early when it occurs. So if you have somebody that does have a concussion, you must be absolutely sure that they can participate and do everything normally without headaches, without impairment, without problems, going to school, doing everything before they're allowed to play. So what happens? With the second impact syndrome. Well, an athlete appears stunned and with, with or without losing consciousness, gets up on their own power and uh, seems to be fine, but then soon collapses. They basically, they have rapidly dilating pupils. They have loss of eye movement. They begin in respiratory failure from brainstem, beginning of respiratory failure from a brainstem injury. And basically, uh, because of the fact that more than likely inside their brain, there's swelling. It's put it on the brain. It develops really fast. So you're going to see this thing called MTBI assessment, which means mild traumatic brain injury. Uh, so this would be like a mild concussion. Um, one thing you have to understand is that uh, if you ever have a concussion or a head injury, assume there's a neck injury. Same thing is true. If you have a neck injury, assume there's a head injury. So if somebody is complaining that their neck hurts, also assess and assume that they have a concussion. Uh, one of the things that you can uh, test um, people on about how they're recovering or how they're doing is look, it's called post-traumatic amnesia, PTA. There's two types. There's retrograde and amnesia. Uh, so retrograde is they can't recall what happened before that, like where they're playing, the play. They can't remember who they're, where they're at, their name, everything. And then there's anterograde amnesia which is the ability, reduced ability to form new memory. Now, this could be such as remember these three numbers and then a couple 30 seconds a minute later, what are those numbers? And they can't remember them, you know, giving them some type of thing to remember. And so they can't form that memory. So those are two forms of amnesia. Um, children should not be returned to practice or play until clinically completely symptom free which may require a long time the results. That's the key word right there. They must be symptom free at rest and also with doing normal exercises without contact. Cognitive rest is helpful with special reference to a symptomatic child's need to limit exertion with activities of daily living and to limit scholastic and other cognitive stressors. So things like they have problem doing text messaging, playing video games, um, you know, that's going to be a problem that they're not, if they can't even do those things, that there's nowhere close for them to participate in a contact sport. Uh, some special considerations for the young athlete is damage to the maturing brain can be catastrophic and permanent impairment. So in the grand scheme of life, a football game is very insignificant. However, incorrect decision-making at that time could be a very significant uh part of their future affecting them in a very negative way. Uh, there seems to be also, um, <clears throat> there's a certain people, people that are more susceptible, more better suited to play football and contact sports. Some people are not caught out to that. They get injuries, they have dizziness, they have head impacts. So what happens is, is you got to understand that the <clears throat> majority of brain of a young athlete is special and must be considered uh, in making decisions. Athletes under 18 should be managed more conservatively using stricter RTP or return to play guidelines than those manage concussions in the more mature athlete. So it is inappropriate 
to extend it is it is appropriate to extend the amount of time before they're allowed to play. It is not appropriate for a child athlete to return to play on the same day as the injury, regarding the level of the performance or the importance they are to the team. Concussion modifiers apply even more to this population than adults, but may mandate more cautious return to play advice. So you've got to be absolutely sure, even if they say, I'm feeling great, feeling time, waiting an extra week, and judging their behavior may be beneficial. A concussion history is important. But no, but no many athletes will not recognize all the concussions they have suffered. So they may have said, I've never had a concussion, but they've had symptoms. So basically, I pre-identify athletes that fit into a high-risk category. They've had diagnosed concussions before. Or people that play certain positions, like receivers or people on special teams, quarterbacks. Um, this basically also... Um, allows a great opportunity for you and the league to educate the players, the parents, the coaches in the league about the significance of concussion and your commitment to take care of this and treat it uh, with the respect it deserves. Uh, a structured concussion history should include specific questions as to previous symptoms of concussion, not just the perceived number of past concussions. And also, um, it's also worth to ask other people such as teammates, um, and and uh, players but that may be unreliable also so warning signs to seek if immediate help if a, char if a you know, player has been injured uh, if you can't wake them up uh, their headaches are worsening or getting severe they are exhibiting mass confusion they're uh, having the restlessness and steadiness or experiencing seizures they can't see, they can't visualize. And this is one of the common things that after a concussion, the brights, most of the games are during the day, and this, they can't open their eyes at the sunlight because of the fact that it basically affects their brain in that, in that way. So difficult with vision. Uh, if they're vomiting, they have a fever, a stiff neck, uh, they basically lose control of their bowel or bladder, or weakness or numbness involving the body part. Any one of these things is a warning sign to get immediate help. So basically... Um, most symptoms or most problems will resolve over a period of days, weeks, or months after concussions. And um, post-concussion symptoms, things that linger, may result from the brain or from the neck and uh, head structures causing problems. And But the most common symptoms uh, of concussion or lingering are the headache and the dizziness. Uh, other symptoms may include blurred vision, neck pain, fatigue, problems sleeping, emotion or cognitive disturbances, ringing in the ears or tinnitus, problems with balance or coordination, loss of hearing, taste of smell. Um, if there's any loss of consciousness, any loss of consciousness or even suspected loss of consciousness, it is an immediate transportation by the ER to the ER by emergency medical services. So if they have any type of confusion lasting more than 15 minutes, uh, their deterioration and functioning, their consciousness, um, they're having trouble breathing, uh, the pulses are weak, their blood pressure goes up, or they have unreactive pupils, which would require that this probably be be evaluated more by uh, medical personnel, but any of these things are an immediate transport by emergency medical services, meaning call them, call in the ambulance and get them to the emergency department. Uh, other things being cranial nerve deficits, um, uh, anything type of thing or you might suspect is a spine, skull fracture or bleeding, uh, mental status changes, confusion, agitation, lethargy, they can't uh, concentrate, seizures, vomiting, any of these things that are at really, really out of the ordinary. And so this should be very easy to recognize. If they're throwing up, if they're having trouble with the lights, if they're dizzy, if they have a headache, if they're feeling out of it, you got to get them transported immediately. They can't walk. They need help. Um, the symptoms worsen. Uh, so basically, they're on the sidelines. Now they're worse than they were on the field. Uh, basically, if they uh, still have symptoms at the end of the game, they all need to be transported. Uh, delayed referral. Uh, things get worse after the game. Um, they do not get better over time. Uh, the symptoms, the number of symptoms go up. And they start interfering with daily activities. Um, one of the things that the people can't do at home 
They say they can use uh, acetaminophen or Tylenol for headaches. Uh, ice pack on the head and neck is needed for comfort because many times, remember, I said if there's a head injury, so consider there's probably a neck injury. Uh, they should eat a light diet of easy to digest foods. Uh, they can return to school. They can go to sleep. And they need lots of rest, no strenuous activity or sports. Um, on the field of sideline evaluations, uh, is, is a central component in the assessment of injury. Knowing what happens, where they're at, and how it's changing over time is important to decide what to do. Uh, a brief neuropsychological test batteries that, have, that assess attention and memory function have been shown to be practical and effective. This is such like where you're at, what's your name, who you play in, what school do you play for, what city you're in, uh, what happened in the game, what position you play. Can you remember these numbers? Can you remember these letters? Any of these type of things are great ways to figure out and assess how, they, how they're doing. If they can't do that, then they're pretty much uh, on the in a full raging concussion and they need to be transported. Um, duration of loss of con consciousness is an acknowledged predictor of outcome. The longer the loss of consciousness, the more serious the problem. So, in the sideline evaluation, when any of the player shows any features of concussion, they should be medically evaluated on site using standard emergency man management principles and should basically attention should be given to assess if they also have a cervical spine injury and uh, hopefully you have a health care provider on the sidelines that could do this that could uh, have be have a little bit more will have a lot more training about recognizing this uh, so basically if there's no health care provider and you're the coach and you're the one that's making the decisions err on the side of being conservative get them out of the game get them to the hospital either by the er or the parent taking them and basically make sure that you get a um, referral a release from the uh, physician for them to play and then when they come back you still have to watch them so one thing if anybody has a, a concussion they should not be left alone Somebody should monitor their symptoms and how they're doing ask them how they're doing how things are changing most of the time most of the time, they may be a little out of it. When they come off, they have a little bit of a headache. It goes away quickly, you know, and then basically they're, they're going to be fine, but just keep them out of the game. Um, like I said, a player with a diagnosed or suspected concussion should not be allowed to learn to play on the day of the injury. Um, the one, A lot of times there is uh, people want to know what was the uh, grade of concussion. Well, mild is no loss of consciousness, uh, they have some post-traumatic amnesia and po symptoms that res res resolve within 24 hours. That's a grade one mild. That's a minimum of one week of being out and then another week of making sure that they can do all the normal things. A grade two moderate loss of consciousness, any loss of consciousness, less than a minute, or post-traumatic amnesia greater than 30 minutes, uh, post-concussion uh, signs and symptoms, uh, Greater than 24 hours, less, that's a grade 2. Moderate 3 is loss of consciousness grade for a minute. A grade 3 is very severe. Uh, pretty much, you're done for the season. Uh, doesn't mean you can't come back the next year, but that takes a lot of healing. Uh, the American Academy of Neurology has uh, a similar grading system, and it's pretty, it's pretty much the same. The only difference is... Uh, a grade two, you can still have no loss of consciousness, but what happens is the symptoms last greater than 15 minutes. Uh, one of the things that we're doing here while you're taking this course is basically to have a training course so you can assess and be advised and educated about how to take care of kids and manage people with concussion on your team. So basically, uh, basic, basically the basic rules are this. You suspect they have a concussion, get them out of practice, get them out of the game, get them evaluated. If they do have a concussion, they must have a removed from the game, they must be seen by a doctor or transported by an emergency medical system, and then they must have a release from the doctor, the doctor play, and then when they come back, you must introduce them or RTP protocols, and we'll talk about that in a second about what to do. Um, return to play. Uh, the cornerstone of concussion management is physical and cognitive rest until the symptoms resolve, meaning 
let them get better, and then a greater program of exertion prior to medical clearance in play. The recovery and outcome of this injury may be modified by a number of factors that may require more sophisticated management strategies, and the importance of considering each person as an individual cannot be overemphasized. So basically what you want to do is called a stepwise project. Right? A stepwise progression. Athletes should continue to proceed to the next level of asymptomatic at the current level. Each step should take 24 hours. An athlete would take one week to proceed through the full rehab protocol. If any post symptoms occur while in the stepwise program, they should drive back to the previous symptomatic level and try to progress again after a 24-hour period of rest has passed. So signs. Of, so these could be include things like immediately when they come back. That would involve running doing drills, exerting without contact and without pads. The next thing would be running full speed, cutting, doing drills, uh, more things that are more strenuous to the body over a period of time and making sure that they can go through the whole practice. After that would be putting on pads and uh, light hitting, contact, practicing uh, without any problems up to full uh, full practice, full progression where they're actually participating in practice like everybody else without any signs or symptoms. So getting back some of the signs and symptoms of concussion, um, the interesting thing about this is you must understand what the baseline of your players are. Um, Because a lot of times, a lot of these signs and symptoms of concussion, many coaches jokingly refer to this is how they perform most of the time, such as disorientation, they appear dazed, they're confused, they forget the game rules or play assignments, the inability to recall score or opponent, they are inappropriately emotionally, they're in poor physical condition, uh, slow verbal responses, personality changes. Those are also signs of concussion, but uh, definitely some of the clear ones are loss of consciousness, uh, loss of uh, memory of amnesia, uh, seizures, uh, person, uh, slow verbal responses. Uh, these can include headache, dizziness, nausea, or vomiting, difficulty balancing, vision changes, of uh, very sensitive to light or to sounds. They feel out of it. They can't make a decision. They have ringing in their ears. They're drowsy. They're tired. They're sad, and they're hallucinating. So basically, in sign of thinking, think deficits. What can't they do? Um, if they can't pay attention to what you're saying. They seem out of it. Uh, they're confused mental status. They don't know who they are, where they're at. They can't remember anything. They have that dazed, vacant stare. They're incoherent speech. And if they're vomiting or if they're nauseous, these are signs and symptoms of uh, concussion and must be dealt with immediately by transport to an emergency room. Uh, the slow modal and verbal responses. Emotional liability may become over-emotional. They can't remember anything, poor carnation, dizziness, headaches, restlessness, uh, hypersensitivities. Uh, they're tired. Uh, and they also have excessive sensibility to stuff as pain, light, touch, or sound. So in summary, and regarding p concussions and the health and welfare of these athletes, be smart. Look at the big picture of life, not just the big picture of that game. Error on the side of safety. A return from play note does, from a doctor does not get you out of jail free. If they get a return to play and they go out there and they're exhibiting symptoms and they have a second concussion, you may be liable. So just do the right thing. Protect yourself, the players, and the league. And understand that if you do this correctly, you'll not only protect yourself, the league, and the player, but if something should happen, God forbid, and there is a catastrophic event, at least you would have been following the protocols to protect yourself in the league. Nothing will take the, uh, the, the place of a um, player that's injured and had permanent forever. You would feel terrible about that, but that doesn't, that can be avoided by being smart and doing the right thing. So if you ever have any questions regarding concussions, if you'd like a presentation to your parents, to your coaches, uh, I'm available to do this. My number is 626-991-8877 or email me, dennis at healthadvantage.net and have a great and safe season.